Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 413th episode, we've got a bunch of news, including a new dinosaur mummy. Also a couple new dinosaurs and Uh some pathologies in tyrannosaurs. Oh, I love pathologies, tyrannosaur or otherwise. (laughs) You get so excited. (laughs) There are some pathologies on the dinosaur mummy too, which are a first of their kind, which is pretty exciting. Well, that's cool. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Amphicelius. This is one of those where I'm surprised we haven't done it before. It's been a while since I've said that. <laughs> it has been a while. <laughs> That's a very famous, very large sauropod. Mm-hmm. And we have a fun fact, which is a 10-parter, but ends in a dinosaur shipwreck with sunken treasure, which what? is something I had never heard of before, but it's really cool. Thing. It could have been its own fun fact, and I didn't discover it until I was getting to part 10 of my fun fact. <laughs> and I was like, should I scrap the whole thing? Fun fact part two. Yeah. But anyway, I didn't want to break it up because it all ties into different parts of this episode. Don't want to leave anyone in suspense. Yeah. But before we get into all of that good stuff, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep our podcast running. And this week, we'd like to thank Jurassic Jim, Cameron, Scott, Ermel, Ellen, Jared Copeland, Kalosaurus Rex, Shelby, Reed, and Ewan. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Your support really helps us keep the show going. And especially nowadays, because we're right about to leave for SVP, which means we got to pay for plane tickets and hotel rooms and all that stuff. So all of our patrons really help us to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So as a thank you, we're going to be releasing that premium content with some extra SVP goodness to all of our patrons. So if you're interested in any of that, please consider joining at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into the news, up first is our new Dinosaur Mummy. It was written by Stephanie Drumheller and others and published in PLOS One. Every time I see that last name, Drum Heller. Mm-hmm. You think and, of Alberta? Yeah. And yeah, because that's where the Royalty Old Museum is. But she's not affiliated with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool last name. Even though she should be. But yeah. <laughs> so th- technically, this isn't a brand new dinosaur mummy. It's a new study of an existing, a previously known dinosaur mummy. Mm-hmm. It's an Edmontosaurus from the Hell Creek Formation. I think it was... Originally discovered in 1999, oh. but it couldn't have been excavated until 2000 because that's the specimen number that it has. Mm. Indicates that it was from 2000. It's nicknamed Dakota. You might be familiar with it. It's at the North Dakota Heritage Center and State Museum in Bismarck. And at least part of it has been on display since 2008. And I actually drove through Bismarck just a couple months after it was put on display, but completely missed it. Oh, no. Because I wasn't following dinosaur news at the time. It's a bummer. Was this the one that was just a leg? At that point, that was all that was on display. But and then they've been working. I think we've talked about this dinosaur that when they've been slowly been working on it. Yes, they definitely have. And yeah, it was probably your news items, which is probably why I don't remember it. But I see. <laughs> it's hard to remember all of the news. In 2014, more of it went on display, including some of the skin. And it was found in the most southwest corner of North Dakota. So it's near South Dakota and Montana Mm -hmm. in that little three-state point. And from that area, you probably noticed that that is the Hell Creek. So yes, this is one of the latest Cretaceous Edmontosaurus specimens. The mummy is nearly complete, or I should say that Edmontosaurus is nearly complete. It's just missing the head, the tip of the tail, and the left arm. Oh, man, if there was a mummified head, that would have been amazing. I think we might already have those, like that trachodon mummy in quotes that's at the American Museum of Natural History. I think that one might have a head. I'll have to double check. But of the areas that they have of the dinosaur, more than half of it, I would say, is covered in skin, Hmm. which is a lot of skin. Sometimes we get like just little patches of skin or, Mm -hmm. you know, like little tiny pieces, like with Tyrannosaurus. The best we have is like a couple impressions that are like mostly postcard size. (laughs) These are like square yards of mummified skin. It includes a huge continuous area of both hind legs and the hips through all of the preserved tail. 
So basically, so the back half. Yeah, essentially the whole back half. It's the back half of an Imantosaurus is bigger than the front half. <laughs> <laughs> if you start from in front of the hips, it also includes the front right leg or right arm, depending on how you want to think about the four limbs of a Edmontosaurus. So it's sort of a separated piece. That one's not connected to the other skin. But it's super cool that they have both the front and hind limbs because you can see all those details of what their feet looked like yeah. you know, with all the skin on them, which is so cool. The skin is actually a little bit shiny due to the high iron content in what it fossilized in. So some people were describing it as like glittering or sparkling, which I think is pretty cool. That is cool. Even now, it's still being prepared. They're taking their time since it's such a large and important and delicate specimen. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever seen a single individual skeleton that has taken this many hours of prep work. They said they've taken at least 14,000 hours of preparation work so far. Wow. That's about seven years of one person working full time every day, <laughs> every weekday at least. I wonder how many people they've got working on it. Yeah, I'm not sure. It might just be one person because it's been, you know, 20 years. Yeah. So 14,000 hours could fit into that. I think Borealopelta was somewhere around 5,000 hours hmm. worth, but Borealopelta is much smaller than an Edmontosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a huge animal that I, I can imagine why it's taking so long. And how delicate it is. Mm -hmm. The latest discovery in this paper is that there are tooth or claw marks in the skin. Oh, poor Edmontosaurus or poor Dakota. Yes. It's, I mean, it's not great. Fortunately, possibly for Dakota, these might have been post-mortem, so might not have felt any pain mm. from these injuries. And those are the new pathology that's never been seen before. Nobody's ever found preserved skin with claw marks or tooth marks in them. Yeah. I should say fossilized skin from a dinosaur. We've seen it in other quote-unquote fossils, you know, like ancient people and mammoths and things like that, but never in a dinosaur. I guess the only way to tell if a pathology happened while the dinosaur was alive is if there's traces that it was healing yes. or signs it was healing. Yeah. Yeah. And there are no signs of healing anywhere on this. So. And then it's like, well, it could have died like that or, or because of that or it happened after it died. It's so hard to tell. Very true. As a quick side note, I just read about a giant sunfish that was found. It was <laughs> dead and floating and they found a big bruise in its side. They don't know though if it was the bruise that caused it to die or if the bruise happened after. Interesting. That just reminds me of the baby whale thing on mm. YouTube because that was a sunfish. <laughs> it's like my favorite YouTube video ever. But <laughs> so back to this Avantosaurus. Yeah, it didn't heal. So we know that it was not surviving the injuries, but a couple of the injuries were pretty gnarly and the type of thing you'd only expect to see during scavenging, not like a fighting injury. Okay. So they can't tell exactly what clawed at it. Crocodilians, raptors, and T-Rex all had big enough claws that could match the pattern of scratches on it. That only sort of narrows it down. Yeah. <laughs> the base of the tail has these V-shaped patterns, and they think that those are claws since they could change spacing as they're dragged. You know, if you think about a mouth dragging, the teeth aren't moving around, so you mm -hmm. get more of like a rake look but with claws since they can get closer together or farther apart in mid swipe mm -hmm. then you can get more v shapes rather than parallel lines so essentially any of the main predators in north dakota at the end of the cretaceous could have been the ones clawing at this dinosaur's tail the tooth marks on the arm were likely made by a smaller predator just based on the size of the indents but it's also possible that they were made by insects burrowing into the skin they just said they couldn't rule it that out that seems to happen a lot. Yes. We have evidence of it almost certainly being insects in some bones and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I know from looking at some taphonomy studies that man do flies like a decaying animal. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's gnarly. But I was thinking at first glance, it might seem like a large predator and then it turns out to be something much smaller. Yes. Yeah, sort of like the reported UFO videos where it turns out to just be like a fly right in front of the camera. Mm. <laughs> yeah, insects can be tricky that way. They're also less likely to be insects, though, in this case, because there's a pretty consistent spacing to the punctures. So it seems more like teeth than 
you know, claws or insect burrowings. The authors tried to classify the tooth marks in dinosaur skin, probably for the first time, because, you know, we don't really have teeth marks in dinosaur skin. Mm -hmm. But skin is much more elastic and pliable than bone. So it's way harder to figure out what bit something. Oh, because it could have changed. Yeah. So the skin could have change the shape or something it could change afterwards but if you think also about like biting something soft as you bite it it deforms Mm. and then it sort of changes back and if you bite it multiple times or things it can just get very mushed around in the mouth Mm -hmm. as it's biting it so a single puncture could happen when the animal in this case we're looking at an arm right so if the arm if it bit it around the whole arm and sort of kept the skin roughly in shape, Mm -hmm. it could puncture it sort of, and then when it went back to its original shape, it would look roughly similar. Or it could sort of bite it while it's sort of dragging its mouth a little bit, Mm. and the holes go through, and then when it shrinks back to its original shape, they could get all distorted. And you'd be like, oh, that it was coming in at this angle, or it had this shaped tooth, but it doesn't actually have that shaped tooth. It's just the way that the skin got mushed Mm mid-bite. So... They really couldn't figure it out in the end. They tried looking at some analogs for bite marks in skin that we have, which are mostly from humans. And they said that in some cases, you can tell that it was a different animal. For example, the difference between what a human bite looks like in human skin and a dog bite looks like in human skin. But we just don't have the data there for an Edmontosaurus. And we don't even know how thick the Edmontosaurus skin was Hmm. and things like that. So we're missing a lot of details that we would like to have in order to really nail down what was biting it. When combined with the marks in the bone, which are much more definitive, the most likely biter is a crocodiliform. They found that there was some evidence of crushing, but there weren't any clear serrations. So if there were serrations, you'd think Tyrannosaur, no serrations, you'd think Crocodiliform, basically. Right. There's one quote, which is pretty gross, but I thought was a good description of what happened. This is one of the injuries, which was probably during scavenging. All right. They said, quote, Prior to burial, the skin that originally covered the humerus was torn, inverted inside out, and pulled down the forelimb, partially degloving the arm and exposing the internal soft tissues and bones for further modifications, end quote. Degloving. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty... I think we might have seen degloving mentioned before. But so, yeah, it's essentially like on the upper arm, it ripped all the way around, you know, like fully around the skin Mm -hmm. of the arm and then pulled it down and it fossilized like that. So, it's like a mid-eating fossilization. It's really crazy. And you can learn so much from that, but oh, (laughs) yeah, that imagery. It is rough. And I'm sure by that point that Montosaurus was dead because you don't go after arm meat as a first thing, and definitely you don't deglove mid battle. Like mm-hmm. that is that's an intense feeding type move. There was one other comment that I thought was kind of funny. I mean, I don't know if the first comment was funny, but they said that the tail is 95 centimeters or three feet deep near the base, mm-hmm. saying, quote, it's evidence that the specimen had an extremely thick muscular or fatty tail in life. Oh, okay. I mean, three feet or basically a meter is a very large tail. Yeah. And that's just the height of it near the base of it. Not at the base, near the base. That'd be interesting. If it was fatty, you'd think that more predators would have gone after it because it might have been tastier. Yeah. And we, we think it was probably very muscular, which is probably why they said muscular first and mm-hmm. then or fatty. Because of what we think with the caudofemoralis muscle and them being likely pretty quick and using the tail for locomotion and stuff like that. But could be fat too. You know, all you can tell is that the skin was around something. Yeah. And it wasn't just bone. <laughs> I'm sure it was a mix at the very least. Yeah, definitely. The most interesting thing is that this mummy was apparently scavenged or at least left out for long enough to get chewed on quite a bit. And previously to this find, the assumption has been that mummified dinosaurs had to be buried quickly before scavengers could get to them. Oh, but this one was left out, so something else happened to mummify it. Yeah, exactly. So the authors proposed a different mechanism than quick burial, 
There's also the sort of falling into an anoxic area of water like Borealopelta. This would be a third way that they call desiccation and deflation. And desiccation is just a fancy word for drying out. Basically, they think that animals punctured the skin with those tooth marks and claw marks and things like that Mm -hmm. to get at tasty internal organs or a few other choice bits, but they didn't eat it completely leaving the tough skin and some of the less meaty parts like parts of the limbs alone. And this makes sense because scavengers usually skip the skin. Hmm. That's why vultures are bald because they shove their heads inside the animal Mm -hmm. and eat like the internal organs and muscle and fat and whatever. And then they pull their head out. They don't mess with the skin at all. Hmm. So that might have been happening with some of the scavenging here. They were just going for some choice pieces here and there, like the upper arm, but leaving the lower arm alone. And then, you know, maybe some stuff around the tail or something. But this might have been really helpful for the fossilization process or mummification process because it left all of these holes throughout the body. And that allowed the decomposing Edmontosaurus juices to drain out. That's I mean, in some ways, it's similar to how humans are mummified, right? You take out the organs. Yeah, exactly. That was my first thought, too, was that it's just like the Egyptian process of preparing a person for burial. I don't think they intended them to become mummies. Mm. Maybe they knew something about that, but I don't think they were like digging up their own dead and seeing what happened to them. It was just part of the ritual of you remove the organs. It was sort of an embalming process. And as a side effect... It ended up keeping the skin and a lot of other parts of the body preserved because there wasn't this basically area, this wet region for bacteria and other stuff to thrive and then break down the skin later because the skin doesn't have that much nutritional value on its own. Mm -hmm. So it kind of relies on that wet environment in order to get to the skin eventually, I guess. So yeah, with this Edmontosaurus, we think it wasn't sitting in its own juices. It was free to dry out and then desiccate. Then the next step is deflation, which basically just refers to the skin collapsing onto the bones before it's buried, which is probably helpful because if it was just like a little bit of skin and it was way far away from the bones, it would be pretty easy to miss. Mm -hmm. There's a chance they didn't get into it, but I think there's a chance that being right by the bones might actually help in the fossilization process too in more than just the the strength of it. It might help with the chemistry of it fossilizing too. But the authors noted that they still don't know why it seems like hadrosaurs are the main dinosaurs to mummify. We have several mummified hadrosaurs at this point, but not really great mummies of really anything else. Yet. Yeah. There's always hope. <laughs> there is. So I was just trying to get some random guesses. They didn't have anything in the paper, but some of the things I thought of is maybe their skin was thicker and or less tasty Hmm. and therefore it got left alone more, or maybe it had a different chemistry that made it more likely to fossilize. You know, say it had more calcium in the skin Mm -hmm. for making it tougher or something like that, that can make it more likely to fossilize. Or maybe their skin was toxic like toxic birds. <laughs> and I looked it up. I know that toxic birds have toxins in their feathers, but many of them also have toxins in their skin. So it would make sense that if there was a toxic dinosaur, mm-hmm. other than toxic birds, that it might have toxic skin. And then maybe that was why hadrosaurs were so successful and things like that, mm-hmm. you know, if they had toxic skin. It's an interesting idea. It's just my random hypothesis of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Did hadrosaurs have toxic skin? (laughs) We might be able to figure that out by chemically testing the skin because it does still have some chemistry, some of its original chemistry available. But unfortunately, toxic things tend to be pretty reactive. So that might be one of the harder things to detect. But there you have it, Dakota, more information. Yeah. And after a a few thousand more hours of preparation, maybe we'll be able to see the rest of it. I mean, there's definitely a lot to learn there. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Although, oh, the degloving. Yeah. <laughs> well, as promised, we've got a couple of new dinosaurs to talk about. We'll start with Ambirosaurus rothi. This was published in Nature by Christopher Griffin and others. And it's an early dinosaur. It's actually one of the earliest dinosaurs, and it lived in the far south of Pangaea in temperate climates. Cool. This is the far south of Pangaea. Well, what is now Zimbabwe. Oh, okay. 
So it was found in the Pebbly Arcos Formation, and it's from about 230 million years ago. Yeah, it's pretty old. Mm -hmm. So it looks a lot like early dinosaurs. It was bipedal, you know, walked on two legs. It had a long tail, long legs, a relatively small but elongated head. It's estimated to be about six feet or 1.8 meters long. It also had leaf-shaped small teeth. Yep, that sounds like an early dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Whether it was a sauropodomorph or, (laughs) you know, they all kind of looked like that back then. Yeah, that's true. This one is classified as a basal sauropodomorph. Oh, it was. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the early stuff we find is sauropodomorphs for some reason. Yeah, good job, sauropodomorphs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the holotype includes a nearly complete skeleton. There's parts of the skull, vertebrae, rib fragments, parts of the forelimbs and hind limbs, and a partial pectoral and pelvic girdles. They also have a second partial skeleton. It's larger than the holotype. It's 15% larger. Oh, cool. It must be less complete, though, since I didn't pick it for the holotype. Yes. The histology, they did histology of the tibia, and they found that the specimen, this is the holotype, wasn't done growing, but it had slowed down in its growth. There's scars on the forelimb and hindlimb, and that suggests that it was nearly mature. We see this in other early dinosaurs. The genus name, Imbirsaurus, comes from Imbir, which is, quote, an historic Shona empire and district containing the study area. End quote. And the species name, Rothai, is in honor of Michael Roth for his contribution to Zimbabwe paleontology and the fossil heritage of Zimbabwe. Nice. The fossils that were found in this formation in Zimbabwe, they are really similar to the kinds of animals that we see together, fossil assemblages, in what's now South America, Brazil and Argentina, and India. Hmm. Uh, they also found it. In this assemblage, there's a Herrerasaurid, early mammal relatives, Adasaurs, and Rhynchosaurs. Oh, cool. So that might mean that similar animals were widespread at this latitude. Yeah, India was way down south at that point, too, we should mention. (laughs) Yeah. It was not up uh, connected to Asia at that point. Well, I mean, I guess it was connected in a roundabout way since it was Pangea. Right. Yeah. It's not too surprising because we think there was that big desert in the middle so that animals couldn't really go from the south to the north or vice versa, but these would have all been in the south. So interesting you bring that up because there were not many geographic barriers in the late Triassic, this time period, but the authors talk about how there may have been climate belts. Mm -hmm. So it was probably more humid. There was probably a lot of vegetation, which is good for sauropods. Early theropods might have been more climactically resilient, but more arid and unstable low latitudes might have made it harder for them to move around the continent, so it would have taken them a little longer. Yeah, that's what I was talking about with the big arid belt in the middle. Mm -hmm. The team, they made a model and they found that dinosaurs were more likely to move around when these climate barriers were lowered. And that coincides with the Carnium pluvial event which is, quote, a global period of extended humidity that would be expected to lessen the intensity of tropical arid belts, end quote. Yeah, I think we might have talked about the Carnian pluvial event (laughs) in the past, but the Carnian would have been going on at this point. I didn't realize that they thought that the pluvial event was enough to enhance migration. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, basically after this, the dinosaurs started moving further north. Oh, I see. Yeah, since all the early dinosaurs we have are south. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then after the Carnian, you see them a little bit in the northern part. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So their model suggested that the theropods moved north first, and then the sauropods or sauropodomorphs. So they moved at different times. Mm. And then after that, there was less movement during the rest of the Triassic. Uh, Mostly, I think there's like one exception. But the team interpreted that as the reestablishment of these climate barriers. So they suggested that these climate barriers affected the movements of other animals too, like mammals, turtles, amphibians, other reptiles, and that's influenced these groups even today. Nice. Yeah, those barriers are really good for getting different 
evolutionary pathway started. Mm -hmm. If everything can mix up and interbreed and everything, you end up usually having less biodiversity than when things get all split up. It's pretty crazy to think, though, that some of those animals, hundreds of millions of years later, are still on these different pathways. Yeah. <laughs> from something that happened way back then. Yeah. Just another good reminder of, you know, it's not just there's another new dinosaur, but now we understand more about their movements and even animals today. Mm hmm. And I know you've got one more new dinosaur, but before we get into that, let's quick pause for a sponsor break. And now for our next new dinosaur, we've actually talked about this one before. It's Nevada Dromaeus schmidti, but it's been officially published now. Nice. This was published in the Journal of the Arizona Nevada Academy of Science by Joshua Bond and others. And Nevada Dromaeus is a Thescalosaurine ornithischian. Try saying that 10 times fast. Hitting both of the C's hard rather than Thescalosaurine ornithischian. Thescalosaurian ornithischian. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I chose to say it that way, but I mean, there we have it. It does feel like you should do one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Nevada Dromaeus lived in the Cenomanian, that's the early late Cretaceous, around 100.5 to 93.9 million years ago. It was found in the Willow Tank Formation, and we talked about Nevada Dromaeus back in episode 358. As a quick reminder, it's the first dinosaur only found in Nevada. It's been compared to being about St. Bernard dog-sized. That's a weird choice because St. Bernards are so bulky. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you think it could? they could have chosen something other than a dog? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, they were probably going by length mm. would be my guess, but then it would have weighed way less. Or, But if it weighed as much as a St. Bernard, it would be so much bigger than a St. Bernard. <laughs> what was bipedal? probably a fast runner. It looks kind of like Hypsilophodon. The paleo art shows it with a somewhat round head. There's a beak, there's long legs and a tail and fairly long arms. The fossils were found in 2008 during a thunderstorm and they include vertebrae, fragments of ossified tendons, part of the femur, some toes, and some not yet identified elements, but those are pretty fragmentary. There's some characters of the femur that make it seem like it is a Thescalosaurian. And that's a subfamily that includes Thescalosaurus and Parkosaurus. Since it's from the Cinemanian, that makes it the oldest known Thescalosaurian in North America because the others in that group are from the Maastrichtian. That's a lot later. Yeah. The species name Schmidtai is in honor of James Schmidt, who urged Joshua Bond one of the paleontologists who found the fossils and the lead author on the paper, to look for the fossils in the Valley of Fire State Park, where Willow Tank Formation is located. Next, as promised, we've got some news on tyrannosaurs. Mm -hmm. Not just pathologies. Actually, this first one is about how having narrower eye sockets might have helped tyrannosaurs and other large theropods have a more powerful bite. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. This was published in Communications Biology by Stefan Ladenschlager. So they compared the eye sockets of 410 specimens, including dinosaurs, ornithopods, thyreophorans, manoraptoriforms, pachycephalosaurs, ceratopsians, theropods, sauropods, as well as crocodiles, pterosaurs, archosauromorphs, and pseudosuchans. And they found that most species, especially herbivores, had circular eye sockets. Mm-hmm. That's what, what we're used to. That is what we're used to. I didn't know there was an alternative to having a circular eye socket. Well, large carnivores with skulls longer than about 3.3 feet or 1 meter tended to have more elliptical and keyhole-shaped eye sockets as adults. As juveniles, they were still more circular. Keyhole-shaped? I can see elliptical keyhole shape seems crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so you could see these kinds of shapes in, as an example, Tyrannosaurus rex and Tarbosaurus batar. And they saw this a lot in theropods. The study mentioned that the specimens that were included, it was all based on whether or not there was fossil skull material available. So there is an uneven distribution for the groups, like over 50% of the specimens in the study were dinosaurs, and then the other groups were each about 10 to 15%. That's fine. 
It's fine to study more dinosaurs, <laughs> less of the other animals. <laughs> Not biased at all. <laughs> he compared the bite forces with theoretical model skulls with five different eye socket shapes. And they found that skulls with the keyhole-shaped eye sockets deformed less when biting compared to skulls with circular sockets. So oh. maybe it helped to reduce stress in the skull. Hmm. Though, as a side note, in the study it said there, a Tyrannosaurus model with a circular eye socket could fit an eyeball with a volume seven times larger than a Tyrannosaurus model with the keyhole-shaped socket. So the keyhole shape meant it had to have a smaller eye. Oh, I see. Yeah, I guess the Tyrannosaur eye socket is keyhole shaped. It's sort. Of, I always think about the the eye is in the top part, mm -hmm. right? And I I sort of ignore the bottom of mm. the keyhole as like that's a separate thing. That's not the eye socket, but I guess it's all it's all part together. Of the eye socket. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so it's basically like the eye is just in the barrel of the keyhole, mm -hmm. and the part that sticks down is just sort of. I guess it's there because evolutionarily it's shrinking the shape of the eye socket maybe for more strength. Yeah. Yeah. So the larger carnivores might have had smaller eyes because of the keyhole shape for their eye sockets. Uh, the paper said, quote, large and well-developed eyes are physiologically expensive and maintaining them may consume up to 15% of an animal's energy budget. Mm. I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah. So it could be, yeah, the narrower eye sockets mean less space for eyeballs, but more space for jaw muscles, and that would have helped the skulls be more robust. Mm -hmm. And it might have also helped make their bites more powerful. And as a bonus, it sounds like the smaller eyes required less energy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of all things are conspiring to give them smaller eyes, mm -hmm. more space for the muscles, less strain on the skull. And less energy required. It's the opposite of the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. The better to see you in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you still do need good eyes to see your prey. Yeah. So I guess that's the limiting factor. They can't just they go They can't blind. just disappear or yeah. get too small. Yeah. So this next paper now is about pathologies in a tyrannosaur, specifically Sue the T-Rex and the holes in the jaws and how it's a mystery what those holes are. <laughs> We're still talking about those jaw holes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was published in Cretaceous Research by Bruce Rothschild and others. So a lot of tyrannosaurid specimens have unusual pathologies or lesions in the back half of the jaw that are, quote, of uncertain origin, end quote. And that includes Sue the T-Rex, also known as FMNHPR2081, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> uh. In case Sue isn't good enough for you. Yeah. We've talked a lot about Sue. Sue was about 33 years old when it died and it had a lot of injuries. The ones in the in the jaw, there's holes that are really large. Some of them are the diameter of a golf ball. Oh, wow. I didn't realize they were that big. I didn't either. On the scale of a Tyrannosaur skull, mm -hmm. they don't look that big when you're looking at it on a picture on like a phone screen or yeah, something. But then you got to remember how big the skull is. Exactly. <laughs> so, yes, that's why we're still talking about it, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, similar injuries have been found in other T Rex specimens. One hypothesis about these holes was that they were from a protozoan infection, Trichomonas. This has been seen in birds. There's a falcon with damage to its jaw, though it turns out what happened to that falcon specimen was not directly caused from the parasite. There was probably a bacterial infection first. Yeah, it reminds me of a lot of those bones that we've seen that have missing chunks. Yeah. And they think it was a bacterial infection that just started sort of eating away at the bone. As a side fun fact... It's not just Garrett who likes the fun facts. Mm -hmm. Quote, approximately 50% of raptorial birds are infected by trichomonas, and it is estimated 100% of pigeons carry it. Ugh, they are flying rats. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, watch out for pigeons, I guess. Now the team compared Sue's jaw to other animals that were infected by trichomonas to see if they were the same. They didn't see any holes in the jaws in a bird skeleton, that was infected by trichomonas, though there were signs of infection and in the back of the throat of that bird specimen. So it looked a little bit different. It seems then unlikely that Sue was infected by trichomonas. 
Also, according to the author's quote, there's no evidence of trichomonas infections prior to the Holocene. The origin of this infection in raptors is through predation on doves and pigeons, end quote. Hmm. So it even originally started with pigeons yeah. and then infected other animals when they ate them. Yes. <laughs> so because of that, they're ruling out this parasite infection okay. as the cause. They also looked at healed fractures in the Triassic Pseudosuchian Stagonolepis, and they compared also healed or healing bones of human skulls with trepanation holes. These were holes in skulls made by Incan surgeons and healers in ancient Peru. So what you do is you, you basically make a hole in the skull on purpose for medical reasons. Yeah. And the holes in Sue's jaw kind of resembles these holes in human skulls. Interesting. Yeah. And but the holes in human skulls were made by metal surgical tools. So And we don't think tyrannosaurs had those. Um uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Safe to say, I think they didn't. Yeah. Now at the height of this practice with humans, and that this practice dates back to ten thousand BCE quote, patients had a survival rate of 70% or higher. So that means there's a lot of signs of healing and no secondary bone infection in these patients, at least the skulls they were comparing to. The team was also able to compare Sue to humans, they said, because both the holes in the head of the humans and the holes in the jaw of Sue are part of the dermatocranium, which, quote, evolved in the common vertebrate ancestors of the synapsid, parentheses human, and sauropsid, parentheses T-rex, lineages. Thus, the bone tissue is homologous and can be compared, end quote. So even though humans and tyrannosaurs are only distantly related phylogenetically, there's this common piece that makes it like, yes, we can compare these holes. Yeah. In the skull, yeah. Because the skin and the bone are similarly constructed. Mm -hmm. Now, they analyzed high-res images of the holes in the jaw of Sue, and they looked for signs of bone regrowth. They did find some, so whatever caused these pathologies didn't kill Sue. Most of the holes have signs that they started to heal, and there was at least a year between when the pathology happened and when Sue died. They focused on eight pathologies, and all but one of those eight holes have smooth beveled edges. Yeah, that's what I remember, that they were very smooth holes, which doesn't sound like healing to me, but I guess sometimes they heal smoothly. Or maybe if you look close enough, you see different signs. Yeah. So as I said, they concluded that Sue's jaw, the holes were not made from an infection. But it's still unclear what caused those holes. Again, they're just in the back of the jawbone. There's no holes in the front of the jawbone. It's possible some ideas are that it could be bite or claw marks, but it's strange that that's only in the back of the jaw. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's related to mating, or it could be related to something else that we haven't even thought of yet. Yeah. Yeah. The infection idea was a more recent one. One of the earlier ideas that was that it was just sort of a feature of the skull because it was so consistent in these tyrannosaurs that like, oh, they had these holes and they had some purpose, like at the root of the tooth, they were doing something or like with the muscles or who knows what. And then later on we heard, oh, maybe it's from biting. And then people were saying, well, maybe they bit in the skin and then that caused an infection into the bone. Mm -hmm. And now we're saying, okay, maybe it's not an infection after all because they don't look quite like infection marks. Yep. And the thing that would cause that sort of infection didn't even exist yet. So what is it? Still a mystery. <laughs> yeah, that's not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last bit of news is that in Australia, Muttaburrosaurus is officially Queensland's state fossil. I'm surprised it hadn't made the cut yet. Well, the contender was Australotitan cuparensis. Oh, yeah, that's better. <laughs> Actually, there were a few contenders, but Muttaburrosaurus won. There was a recent poll by the state government and... Out of 9,000 votes, Muttaburrosaurus got about 2,400. Australotitan got almost 1,200. That's pretty good considering Muttaburrosaurus has been known for a really long time now, and Australotitan was just barely named. Well, it is huge, and it was big news. Yeah, that's true. They had 12 options to choose from. There's some other ones like 
Diamantinosaurus, a Titanosaur. That one came in third. That one's a cool one. Yeah, we saw that out at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum. Mm Mm-hmm. That museum's the reason this all started. They had a petition to add a state fossil, and they were the ones who suggested Diamantinosaurus. (laughs) Yeah. That's one of like three that's named based on that Waltzing Matilda song. (laughs) Yeah. Remember, there was like a whole set of them. (laughs) (laughs) And then there were other options that weren't dinosaurs. I'm surprised that Kumbarasaurus didn't make the cut. Maybe it's because they think it might be a Minmi. Oh, that might be New South Wales. I couldn't find a list of a complete list. I only found seven out of the 12 that were options, so I'm not sure. It might have been in there then. Cool. It's always good to have a dinosaur for your state. Mm -hmm. Muttaburra is a cool place too, so I can see how people in Queensland might want something named after an area in their state rather than Australotitan, which is named after all of Australia. I wonder if that was part of the reason. We also have more of Muttaburrasaurus than we have of Australotitan, so Mm -hmm. we know a little bit more about it. And now we're going to pause for one more quick ad break, but when we get back, we'll hear all about Amphicelius. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Amphicelius, which was a request from Morgan via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a diplodocid sauropod that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Colorado, U.S. It probably looked like other sauropods, specifically diplodocids. There's the long neck, the long whip-like tail, it walked on four legs, and of course it was very large. Hmm. That's probably what it's best known for, is its size. I'd say its size and the fact that it is mysteriously missing, but I'm sure you're going to talk about that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But first, it's estimated to be about 59 feet or 18 meters long and weigh 17 short tons, and I should say that's the estimates now. Yeah, and that's the species that's still considered Amphicelius, not the larger one that used to be Amphicelius. Well, there were three species, now we're down to one. But don't worry, I'll get into that. (laughs) So for a long time, Amphicelius was thought to be one of the largest known dinosaurs. Amphicelius altus, which is the type species and the species that's valid today, looks very similar to Diplodocus. It had long, thin hind limbs. The forelimbs were proportionally longer than other dinosaurs it was closely related to. It also had a long, slender femur. Now, as I mentioned, there were three species named at one point, Amphicelius altus, Amphicelius lattice and Amphicelius fragilimus. And fragilimus is the one most people talk about. Mm -hmm. The biggest one. But again, there's only one valid species now. That's the type species, Amphicelius altus. Amphicelius fossils were found by Ormel William Lucas near Canyon City in Colorado back in 1877. And then it was described by Edward Drinker Cope shortly after, also in 1877. Cope received the fossils in October of that year and then named Amphicelius in December of that year. And that's because, maybe you've already guessed it, it was a Bone Wars dinosaur. (laughs) Of course it was. So, of course, you had to describe those quickly. Yeah, that's impressive. He got them in October and it was already described by December. Mm -hmm. Although back then a description was like two paragraphs, not... Sometimes. (laughs) Some more lengthier than others. Yeah. The genus name Amphicelius means both sides hollow. Cope in 1877 wrote about the fossils that Lucas sent him, quote, He also procured remains of two additional forms of gigantic size, fit rivals of the Camarasaurus, which I referred to the new genus Amphicelius. A species of tortoise was associated with these saurians and appears to have been abundant, end quote. (laughs) What was it doing with those turtles? I don't know, but (laughs) it does seem to come up a lot. (laughs) Is it like how we find Deinonychus with Tenontosaurus, the Samphacelus with the turtles? Cope said nothing like that. (laughs) It wasn't feasting on a field of tortoises. No, oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Cope said that Amphicelius was, quote, allied to Camarasaurus. And he also wrote that Camarasaurus and Amphicelius, quote, attained to the most gigantic proportions, end quote. Now, Cope thought these fossils were from the Cretaceous from around the same time as the Lalaps fossils that he also named. He said that there were differences in the vertebrae, and that's what made it distinct from Camarasaurus. And he described a lot of back vertebrae, a pubis, and femur. Later, Henry Osborne and Charles Mook described it 
as only having two vertebrae, as well as a pubis, femora, a tooth, ulna, that's part of the forelimb, and parts of the shoulder. These fossils were found near the holotype, and they were different from Camarasaurus, and they were found alongside a Camarasaurus. Hmm. So it's possible that even some of the back vertebrae got lost in that brief period of time from going from lots of back vertebrae to just two vertebrae? Well, hold on a second, because (laughs) Emmanuel Schopp and others questioned this assignment of fossils to Amphicelius when they were analyzing Diplodica Day in 2015. They did, however, accept the ulna as being part of Amphicelia. Hmm. So I'll talk about Amphicelia lattice first. Cope also named Amphicelius lattice based on a femur and tail vertebrae. Osborne and Mook in 1921 later said that that belonged to Camarasaurus, so they referred it to Camarasaurus supremus. It's because they found the fossils were more similar to Camarasaurus than Amphicelius. Okay. And they didn't want to name a new genus, so they actually they even assigned it to an existing species, not even assigning it to making it Camarasaurus lattice. Yes. Now, later in 1998, Macintosh suggested that Amphicelius lattice was a synonym of Amphicelius altus. But now, Amphicelius lattice is considered to be a synonym of Camarasaurus supremus. So that's how we got rid of that one. At least for now. Could always change later. That's true. (laughs) Then there's Amphicelius fragilimus. And again, that's the one that has been talked about the most. The species name Fragilimus refers to the fragility of the fossil. There were a lot of thin parts on this fossil, Mm -hmm. which might have been part of the problem. (laughs) The Amphicelius Fragilimus fossil was found near Camarasaurus supremus fossils by Lucas as well. Lucas shipped these to Cope in spring or early summer of 1878, and then Cope published about it that August. So again, very quick. Cope named Amphicelius fragilimus based on a large back vertebra, which has since been lost. He visited Lucas and the quarries where it was found in the summer of 1879 and wrote notes about more Amphicelius fragilimus fossils, a neural spine and femur, but those have also been lost. Oh man, I never knew that they had found more stuff. Me either, so I was looking into this. Yeah. In 1994, there was an attempt to find the quarry where the Amphicelius bones were originally found, but the technique didn't work out. They used radar, but the density of the fossils were the same as the matrix that the bones were in, so they couldn't find the fossils. Oh yeah, they were trying to do that Jurassic Park style Mm -hmm. scan in the ground move. It works sometimes, but unfortunately not often. Also, according to Kenneth Carpenter, the mudstone quote is nearly stripped down to the underlying sandstone, end quote. And based on local topography, This probably happened before Lucas found the Amphicelius fossil back in the 1800s. And that means, if that's true, that most of the Amphicelius skeleton was probably destroyed a long time before he found even that neural spine. I see. So it's like that layer that had Amphicelius in it is probably pretty much gone. Yeah. But back to the vertebra, which Cope based the name on. So in 1878, Cope wrote about Amphicelius fragilimus that the, quote, dimensions of its vertebra much exceed those of any known land animal. (laughs) That is an understatement. The vertebra itself exceeds the dimensions of most entire animals. Yes. (laughs) Land or otherwise. Based on an illustration from 1878, the vertebra was about 8.9 feet or 2.7 meters tall. Oh, man. Though the illustration may have had a typographical error with the scale bar. There's been some debate over that. Mm -hmm. It's massive. Yes. Now, earlier estimates for Amphicelius fragilimus, that it was 130 to 200 feet or 40 to 60 meters long and weighed up to 150 tons, which is massive. That's what was in the books that I grew up with as a kid. When they mentioned Amphicelius, Mm -hmm. it would be like, you think Diplodocus is big. (laughs) And just wait. (laughs) We've got this one vertebra that was so huge. Imagine how big that dinosaur would have been. As you can imagine, there's some skepticism around the massive size of Amphicelius fragilimus. Mm -hmm. In 2015, Carrie Woodruff and John Foster found that the giant size of Amphicelius fragilimus was, quote, most likely an extreme overestimation, end quote. Yeah, that seems likely. (laughs) (laughs) Based on these previous estimates, if they were true, 
this large size. That would make Amphicelius fragilimus the largest vertebrate ever because the largest blue whale is about 98 feet or nearly 30 meters long. Yeah. Well, there are some dinosaurs that were over 100 feet. So if you're talking size by length, there were bigger animals. I guess it just depends how you define large. Yeah. I think you usually do it by weight. And I, from what I remember, I think a blue whale, I guess they can be up to 150 tons. And that would be like around this weight. Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's really hard to imagine a land animal without that benefit of water supporting it weighing as much as a blue whale. Yes. But it's hard to imagine sauropods in general. So it's. <laughs> That's true. It's kind of hard to even imagine blue whales, even though we know they exist. Yeah. If you were to see one, it's not like we could see its entirety easily. Yeah. Yeah. Woodruff and Foster said that based on bone strength, muscle forces, and gravity, animals that lived on land could only get as heavy as about 100 tons, or 90,700 kilograms. They also said that larger animals need more food, and in the ecosystem where Amphicelius lived, there were lots of large sauropods that would also have needed to eat a lot of vegetation. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who said they thought there was a typographical error when it came to the size of the Amphicelius material. They said Cope had a lot of typographical errors in his work, and sometimes he even said the species was fragilimus, and sometimes he called it fragilismus. Oh no, Cope. It could be partly why much more of Cope's dinosaur names got synonymized later than Marsh's. Hmm, could be. In 2006, Carpenter wrote, quote, there's every reason to suspect that Amphicelius fragilimus was indeed one of the largest, if not the largest dinosaur to ever walk the earth, end quote. I also should mention it's accepted that Cope did describe a large vertebra and that it belonged to a giant dinosaur. So we don't think that this fossil was made up. No. So the Amphicelius fragilimus fragmentary vertebra might have been more like 1.5 meters or 4.9 feet high. Yeah, and it was incomplete too. So yeah, what full fragment. size it would have been when it had that neural spine, if it was complete on the top of it, is unknown. But even at that point, one and a half meters or five feet is a huge vertebra. I mean, our vertebra are like one inch, maybe two <laughs> inches. So this is still so much bigger. Carpenter said that there's every reason to accept Cope at his word here. He never made any corrections in later publications. Marsh also never called him out. And we know that Marsh took every opportunity (laughs) to call Cope out. Yeah. And Osborne and Mook accepted these measurements in 1921, as did McIntosh in 1998. It's strange, though, that Cope didn't mention Amphicelius fragilimus in any more scientific papers after he described it. Cope did say that the specimen was delicate and required great care, so it's possible that the fossil crumbled and then was discarded. No. Even if they just kept the pieces, that would have been so helpful. Well, it might have gotten lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Carpenter estimated Amphicelius fragilimus weighed around 122,400 kilograms, that's about 135 tons, based on scaled-up proportions of Diplodocus. In 2006, Carpenter also studied the paleobiology of sauropods and suggested that their large sizes made them more efficient in digesting food, similar to elephants and rhinoceros. And that's because they had longer digestive systems and could digest food over a long period of time, which would help them survive on lower quality plants. Yeah, so that goes to say that they wouldn't have had to like decimate all the edible mm-hmm. <laughs> foliage in the region. Or that they didn't require special, very highly nutritious plants. Carpenter also suggested that other benefits of being large, like being safer from predators, not having to use as much energy, and living longer, were secondary benefits compared to this digestion reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's that never-ending question of why were sauropods just that big. Yeah. Maybe it was because that was the best bioreactor, the best fermentation pit in their stomach. Or just because they could be. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Amphicelius lived in a savanna-like environment. It probably ate ferns. The Amphicelius fragilimus vertebra was lost sometime when Cope sold his fossils to the American Museum of Natural History. 
However, it was still assigned an AMNH catalog number, even though it was never seen at the museum, because Cope apparently never numbered anything, so they numbered everything based on notes, and then the idea was to assign it once the fossil turned up. Oh, Cope, what are you doing? <laughs> the more I learn about Cope, the more I'm on Team Marsh. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They both have their pros and cons, for sure. <laughs> never naming or numbering a fossil is a pretty big con. <laughs> So it was cataloged, Amphicelius fragilimus was cataloged as AMNH 5777. In 1921, Osborne and Mook provisionally synonymized Amphicelius fragilimus with Amphicelius altus, saying that Amphicelius fragilimus was a large individual of Amphicelius altus. They wrote, quote, The type of the species has not been found in the Cope collection and its characters cannot be clearly determined, end quote. So it was lost pretty early on. Mm -hmm. In 2018, Kenneth Carpenter renamed Amphicelius fragilimus as Mara punisaurus, and we covered this back in episode 210. When Carpenter named Mara punisaurus, he made some new estimates on the fossil, mainly that the vertebra was about 2.4 meters tall instead of 2.7, and Mara punisaurus, formerly Amphicelius fragilimus, was about 99 to 105 feet or 30.5 three to 32 meters long. Yeah. If I remember right, it's because that really tall vertebra, they were scaling the length based on animals that basically had smaller vertebra proportionally to their length. Mm -hmm. But there are some similar sauropods that just have really tall vertebra. So when you compare it to those dinosaurs, then it's like, okay, well, it didn't have to be that crazy long. Even if it was that big of a vertebra, it turns out that that's not that crazy for a sauropod. Right. And it could have basically been in the range of normal sauropod lengths because 100 feet is like, yeah, that's a, sauropods were that long pretty often. It's got a lot going for it for why we thought that though was an early find mm -hmm. in the Bone Wars and then it got lost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then people didn't really talk that much about it and like re-estimate its size because it was like, why would you bother? You can't see the bone. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that's, that Kenneth Carpenter looked at it and did that analysis so that it at least... Now we know, okay, yeah, it wasn't this 200 foot. We didn't lose this bone for this hugest sauropod ever, most amazing thing. It makes it a little bit less tragic that we lost that fossil. Mm -hmm. So there's been some species debates around Amphicelius. In 2010, Henry Galliano and Raymond Albersdorfer had a paper that referred fossils found in the Bighorn Basin in the Morrison Formation in Wyoming. These fossils were from private collection. And they referred them to a new species, Amphicelius brontodiplodocus. Brontodiplodocus. Yes. That's a great species name. Well, yes, although it's not a real species name. So they hypothesized that most diplodocids found in the Morrison Formation represented different growth stages or sexual dimorphism and that they were all Amphicelius. Wow, that's quite a hypothesis. Yes, but this paper was never formally published, and then the lead author even later said that it was just a drafted manuscript. Okay. Well, yeah, if it didn't go through peer review, it mm -hmm. doesn't count as anything. Yes. In 2007, John Foster suggested that the features of Amphicelius altus that made it unique might just be because of individual variation, and that Amphicelius may be a senior synonym of Diplodocus. A senior synonym? That should just make it the name. <laughs> well, let me get into that. So in 2015, Woodruff and Foster made the same suggestion that there's only one species of Amphicelius and it could be referred to Diplodocus. Huh. They suggested that the differences between all the species was due to ontogeny growth and that the fossils for Amphicelius altus was an immature specimen and the fossils for Amphicelius fragilimus were from a more mature specimen. And because of this, they suggested that Amphicelius fragilimus should be synonymized to Amphicelius altus. They also said that there weren't legitimate unique features for Amphicelius altus, and they supported referring all Amphicelius material to Diplodocus altus. Because Amphicelius was named first, that's what makes it the senior synonym, hmm. Diplodocus would become Amphicelius, but they said Amphicelius should be a nomum obletum. And that's a name that hasn't been used scientifically for more than 50 years after originally being named, and it's been replaced by a more recent name that is commonly used, and that the name should stay Diplodocus. Oh, that's a bummer. 
<laughs> <laughs> it would be fun to have a controversy of Diplodocus wasn't a real dinosaur. Then it would be like Brontosaurus. Yeah. It would be like, oh yeah, D Diplodocus is also just uh, Amphicelius. Although now some people say Brontosaurus is a valid genus again. I didn't know Gnomum obletums were even an option until this. I do remember, I think there's another term for it too, basically meaning it's an abandoned name, mm -hmm. which is what this is. And I could see too, they were saying that there aren't the unique features on Amphicelius, the specimens that we have, and we're even missing completely some of the species. So it would make sense that you would want to use Diplodocus as a neotype, but that almost makes me feel like that Diplodocus neotype is a neotype of Amphicelius, mm. but I I understand. We've got Diplodocus kids. There's so much use of Diplodocus and Diplodocus kids and all that stuff in the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make sense to rewrite all of that over the, you know, right. It would get more confusing. Yeah, and the whole point of this is supposed to be not to be confusing and to make communication about it clear. So yeah, rewriting it all as Amphicelius is probably not worth it, even though it'd be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in 2021, Philip Mannion, Emmanuel Schopp, and John Whitlock re-described Amphicelius altus, and they found Amphicelius altus to be valid. So oh, that's man. how we got the type species that's the only valid species now. Back again. <laughs> yes. The American Museum of Natural History got the Amphicelius altus fossils back in 1902, and according to the museum, they're the earliest recovered fossils currently in their collection. Hmm. The team in 2021 analyzed the fossils and they found three features that have to do with the shape of the vertebrae and femur that make Amphicelius a valid taxon. So again, type and only species is Amphicelius altus. If that even counts. <laughs> <laughs> it just came back one year ago after not being, or being lumped in with Diplodocus. So who knows how long that'll last. Uh, I think it counts. The right femur is currently in three pieces, but it's mostly complete in length. The team said they couldn't get permission to do histology, but based on the size of the femur, they think the individual was an adult. It's unclear if it was a young adult and still growing or an older adult, but there were no features, quote, associated with advanced age. Okay. Well, it would make sense either way, because what was it? It was in like 50, 60 feet? Is that what you said? Yeah. So yeah, those could be uh, either way, because some sauropods got a lot bigger than that, and a lot of them were adults at that size. Yes. They found that only the holotype represented Amphicelius altus. There are no referred specimens. So there's just the one species and the, it's represented by one specimen. And they also found that there was probably even more diversity in sauropods in the Morrison formation than we previously thought. Nice. Amphicelius is one of those dinosaurs that I feel like most dino nerds know from that history of being considered the biggest ever dinosaur. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's no longer considered the biggest ever if it's even considered its own genus. Well, we have since found some very large titanosaurs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like you were just talking about Australotitan. Mm -hmm. That one was likely bigger than Amphicelius. <laughs> <laughs> and for our fun fact, thinking about Amphicelius and how it went missing slash got destroyed made me think of all the possible ways dinosaur fossils can be destroyed. I know you said it was a 10-parter, but I feel like, well, maybe there's other ways that we haven't even thought of. Yes, there are a ton of ways that you can lose a fossil. <laughs> so basically, while fossils are in the earth, they are not nearly as susceptible to damage as they are after they are exposed. Mm -hmm. By definition, any non-avian dinosaur fossil survives for at least 66 million years before people encounter them. And once they're out of the earth, their life expectancy drops precipitously, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, that's why when there's a fossil sticking out, it's a rush to get the skeleton out. Definitely, yeah. So I came up with at least 10 ways that fossils can be destroyed by either nature or humans. Number one, by far like orders of magnitude most common way for fossils to be destroyed is by weathering. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're talking about. So with the layer cake of fossilized rock, sometimes fossils are getting buried deeper and other times they're getting lifted up or erosion is working their way down to the fossils. And once the fossils are uncovered and no longer protected by rock around them, if no one collects them, it'll get destroyed by weather unless it miraculously gets buried again. Mm -hmm. And that 
I can't even, I don't even think there's a term for that. I was trying to find that. I started Googling like fossil gets reburied and things like that. And I just ended up finding a bunch of weird conspiracy theories about dinosaurs. Hmm. So <laughs> I couldn't find the term for it. But sometimes fossils do get mixed up later after they were fossilized. It's just rare. In areas with icy winters and warm summers, a fossil can get basically destroyed in as little as one season because they can be pretty porous. And if water works their way into the pores and then it freezes, it can expand and damage or even completely destroy the fossil, especially if it's made out of something kind of fragile, then it can just sort of crumble. Mm -hmm. In more arid environments or areas with more mild climates, it can take a lot longer, but even wind and rain will destroy most fossils in a period of centuries. Wind and rain can do a lot of damage. Yes. Yeah. And you're talking about, you know, over the period of centuries, it's not going to last millions of years on the surface unless somehow it fossilized out of something very tough, mm -hmm. which can occasionally happen or it's in a cave or something like that. But in most cases, they just get destroyed by weather. And I think it's one of the best arguments for commercial fossil collecting because commercial fossil collecting gets a lot more people out in the field to find these fossils that would otherwise weather away. A lot of gray areas there. Yeah, there's a lot of people that say, I'd rather they just weathered away and, you know, too many of these fossils would have been discovered by somebody and it would have ended up in a museum if commercial fossil collecting wasn't a thing. But I think that is a valid pro for commercial fossil collecting is that they prevent this weathering, which is the main thing <laughs> that destroys fossils in the world. So the second way I found is that if people encounter fossils, they can be accidentally destroyed before they're noticed. Mm -hmm. Like building and construction projects? Yeah, I'd say the best evidence for it is the large number of partial fossils which are found in quarries and construction sites because <laughs> you can't find half of a fossil that's like, you know, blown off on one side. It means the other half was there. And there are definitely plenty of finds that are just completely missed because somebody was quarrying rock and didn't notice it in their bucket loader or whatever mm -hmm. when they were moving around fossils and there are these big like slag heaps or like off waste piles that people will go through and look for fossils and they find them all the time mm -hmm. so it, it's definitely a common occurrence although these sites can lead to amazing finds that wouldn't have been found otherwise because you know if you're not digging down into the earth it could take a really long time to erode down to that layer mm -hmm. and other times the Fossils are in really amazing condition because they weren't exposed to any weathering at all before their discovery. So some of these, even before they would have made it all the way to the surface, the water making it down to them and things might have started to damage them before mm -hmm. we could see them at all. But since we dug down and found them, they're in better shape than you could imagine surface collecting. I think that was the case for Zool. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I think it was for Borealopelta too. That was discovered in a quarry. So... Yeah, it, it can happen. But occasionally people do destroy them while they're in those quarries. And sometimes they get destroyed after they're discovered. So that mean, leads me to the next way. One of the most annoying ways, I think, to lose a fossil is to vandals. I don't know why people destroy fossils in the field, but it happens way more often than I realized when I was researching this. Mm -hmm. For example, one site in Alberta was vandalized four times over a two-month period in 2012. Wow. One of the specimens was an Amontosaurus that was intended for the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum that was in a plaster jacket, and then people went there, broke open the plaster jacket, and basically destroyed the fossil. Oh, they found a liquor store receipt there, so it was probably bored drunk people. This is why excavation sites are often kept secret. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's one of the main ways that they prevent vandals. Another way is they sometimes just leave it in the ground and like don't really excavate it at all if mm -hmm. they find it at the end of the season and they don't have time to collect it. They leave something to mark the spot that's not too conspicuous and they come back to it the next year. Yeah, or they just keep marked down the GPS coordinates. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they also, if they have started excavation work rather than plaster jacketing it, sometimes they'll just rebury it or put a tarp over it and put dirt on top of the tarp, things like that to make it inconspicuous. But yeah, the number one thing is, like you said, just not publicizing where you found this fossil until it's fully excavated. And sometimes even after it's excavated, they keep the original site secret because there's they, more fossils. Exactly. If they expect there might be more fossils. Apparently, most of the cases of 
Vandalism appears to be theft gone wrong. For example, footprints that people try to chip out and then end up just damaging because it's really difficult to do. It reminds me of that I Love Lucy episode with the John Wayne footprints. Do they try to chip those out? They they do, and then they end up breaking the concrete slab. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly like that. And then that might have even been the case with this Amontosaurus skull that they were trying to get out of the plaster jacket. Mm. They might have just been trying to keep it as a trophy and then destroyed it. But even if researchers get to the point of extraction before vandals, they can also be destroyed during the extraction process. Some fossils are essentially just fossilized dust that's held together by the surrounding matrix. And then as you whittle away that matrix around it, sometimes it just falls apart in the field and there isn't much you can do about it. Occasionally it can be glued so it stays in shape, but other times you can't really do anything about it and it just sort of turns to dust as you lift it out. Mm. Fossils can also be destroyed while they're being jacketed. So to jacket a fossil, basically you cover the top of it in plaster, then you have to flip it over so you can cover the bottom in plaster. And with extremely delicate fossils, sometimes the flipping process can break or even destroy the fossil, although it's usually repairable in those cases. But other times there are fossils underneath it that might get damaged when you're digging underneath it to flip it. So that's another way you can lose a fossil. Sometimes fossils are destroyed during transportation. The craziest one we've heard of is there was a fossil that was getting airlifted out with a helicopter. And as it was lifted in the jacket, the plaster broke. Oh, yeah. And the fossil got folded like a taco (laughs) is how I think they described it. So apparently that fossil got totally destroyed, which is a huge bummer. But yeah, so there's a lot of focus that goes into how thick you make the plaster jacket for these types of things. And then also sometimes they'll even put like a metal case around it to support it if they think the fossil is really fragile inside the plaster. Hmm. Once it's back at the museum, fossils can be damaged or destroyed during preparation. It's much less common nowadays because there are so many awesome preparators out there. But I often wonder for every fossil where there are tiny traces of feathers and other really amazing little details around the fossil, how many others had those little details, like little feather imprints Mm -hmm. that we just missed and got prepared away into the trash. (laughs) Right. It's. I mean, it's kind of unavoidable. You have to move the remove the rock from around it so mm-hmm. you can see what the fossil looks like but and you, techniques have changed over the years and even knowing what to look for has changed exactly yeah we didn't know that there were feathers to look for so of course in the early days they would have been missed if they were there some fossils are also too delicate to prepare properly period because it's you know that dust sort of analogy or the fossil is so similar in density and strength to the rock around it that you just can't chip away the rock without destroying or damaging the fossil. But fortunately now, we can just leave it in the rock and then CT scan it to get most of the information out of it. So that's also helping us destroy less fossils. Fragile fossils can also be destroyed during handling. That's possibly what happened with Amphicelius slash Marapunisaurus slash, I guess, Diplodocus fragilimus. (laughs) I think we'll just stick with Marapunisaurus. Yeah. The Majungasaurus holotype also lost some teeth this way. We saw that one and they had these pictures of like this tooth went missing in, you know, like 1890, we think about when someone dropped it. Some of them they glued back on, but some of the other ones just got lost. Hmm. As a side fun fact, Allosaurus fragilis is also named for being fragile, just like Marapunisaurus fragilimus. Mm -hmm. And that's based on its vertebrae. There are two paragraphs that describe Allosaurus. That's one because it's basically a Bone Wars dinosaur. It's named in the same three page paper as Apatosaurus and Nanosaurus. That paper is jam packed. <laughs> it is. Marsh wrote, quote, Some of the vertebrae have the centra hourglass in form, the middle part being so diminished as to greatly reduce the strength, end quote. So in that case, it wasn't anything unique to like the chemistry or the geology of the fossil. It was they thought Allosaurus alive had really weak vertebrae, basically. Since the Allosaurus fragilis holotype is just vertebrae and a couple referred toe bones, a neotype was proposed in 2010 by Gregory Paul and Kenneth Carpenter, but that case is still open. Hmm. So I don't know. It's been 12 years. I guess paleontologists move slow. Maybe it'll get changed in the future. I don't think they always move slow. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) It's just sort of 
I think, a stereotype because of geology and fossils being such a long, slow process. Oh, I see. I would, I would argue that paleontologists move fast. If you think about the amount of material that gets prepared and described every year. Yeah, that's true. My ninth way to lose a fossil is that even if they're not destroyed by handling, they can get destroyed by their own chemistry. One example is pyrite disease. Oh, yeah. Pyrite is known as fool's gold. That's the common term for it. Fool's gold can get incorporated into the bone during the fossilization process, and a pyrite molecule is made of iron and two sulfur atoms. And if you know anything about sulfur, it's very reactive with oxygen. So it can oxidize into iron sulfate, which is one iron, one sulfur, and four oxygen atoms. And with all those oxygen atoms, a iron sulfate molecule is much larger than a pyrite molecule, which basically means that if it's oxidizing in a bone and expanding, it can destroy the bone just like ice can. Hmm. I haven't heard of it being a problem in fossils, but pyrite oxidation also produces sulfuric acid, which could obviously cause problems depending on the chemistry of the rest of the fossil. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to prevent pyrite disease is to keep it in low humidity because it needs water for that reaction to go ahead. They suggest below 45% humidity, or if it starts expanding, you want to keep it below 30% humidity, which is pretty dry Yeah, <laughs> in order to keep that pyrite disease from spreading or really just oxidation is what it is. And then my last one, last but not least, they can get destroyed when an entire museum or a structure carrying a dinosaur fossil gets destroyed. Like fires or bombs? Yes. So most recently in 2018, most of the National Museum of Brazil burned down, losing tons of important dinosaur fossils. I still couldn't find the full extent of damage. I don't think it's exactly been documented what all is available and what has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. But another even more famous example is that Spinosaurus and the rest of Stromer's fossils from the Bahari Oasis were destroyed in World War II with the Allied bombing of Munich. And that was at the Munich Paleontological Museum. Another museum in Munich, the German Museum, was evacuated actually just seven years ago in 2015 when an unexploded American bomb was found in their courtyard during construction oh, work. Oh, wow. And according to Artnet News, quote, 70 years after the end of World War II, unexploded bombs are still routinely found during construction work in German cities such as Munich, Cologne, and Berlin, end quote. Wow. I did not realize there were still tons of unexploded bombs. I didn't either. But I guess that's the problem with carpet bombing things. It just leaves They're them scattered. Everywhere. Yeah. And the type of detonator that most of them have is like a physical impact one. So if it didn't hit hard enough in the right direction, then they don't explode. And that was the case in this courtyard. But they said it wasn't really a threat to anybody because it's unlikely that it would get accidentally set off unless somebody hit it extremely hard, but you couldn't really do that. So they did end up removing it and then disposing of it mm -hmm. elsewhere, though. Well, that's good. And the last one I'll mention is the SS Mount Temple. It's a Canadian boat I had never heard of before. But it was actually one of the boats that responded to the Titanic sinking in 1912. Oh, then of course you would bring this up. <laughs> I am obsessed with Titanic. I love that movie and the whole story and everything. It's like one of the most interesting tragedies, I think, in history. It's just such a series of engineering mistakes that had to align that I am fascinated by it. But the SS Mount Temple actually never reached Titanic. It did get distress signals from Titanic, but the Titanic really misreported where it was. Their original report of where they were sinking was off by something like 13 miles. Ooh. So it made it a lot more difficult for boats to respond to where it was sinking. And then they also started running into ice. So it was like it was they never actually made it to Titanic. By the time they were about to get there, the Carpathia was there and was already had already pulled everyone out of the water that was around. But this isn't about that. In 1916, the SS Mount Temple was crossing the Atlantic, bringing supplies to France for the war effort when it was sunk by a German merchant raider disguised as a neutral cargo ship. Oh, and were the supplies dinosaur fossils? Some of them. Hmm. So first, though, lots of places say that it was sunk by a U-boat, but they are definitely wrong. It's definitely, we know what boat it was. It's called the, I think it's Mo is how it's pronounced. M-O-W-E with an umlaut over the O. Mm. 
There's a great write-up of the Lost Fossils by Daring Tonka, where I got a lot of information from. So the Mount Temple lost only about four out of the 730 passengers and crew because it basically got boarded and, you know, taken over. Hmm. But it was scuttled and that destroyed all of its cargo. The cargo included 710 horses, 3,000 tons of wheat, 1,400 cases of eggs, several thousand cases of apples, and 22 crates of dinosaur fossils that were intended for the Natural History Museum in London. That's a lot of fossils you can fit in 22 crates. Yes. It also seems weird to me that they were going across the ocean to France to like supply the war, and then they were going to, after that, I guess, go to Britain and drop off fossils. Maybe a lot of the passengers might have been going to Britain, too. Mm. The fossils were collected in Alberta's Dinosaur Provincial Park by Charles Sternberg, and there is a chance that some of the fossils are still in the ship somewhere in the North Atlantic. Treasure. I know. The dinosaur fossils were still in the rock, which was further encased in plaster jackets. And then around all that, of course, there was the wooden crate. So heavy. But it means there were some layers of protection. Mm. It's unknown exactly what was in the crates because the records are incomplete. But the guess is that there were four hadrosaurs with articulated sections of the skeletons that possibly included skin impressions. More hadrosaur mummies, maybe? I don't know about mummies, but maybe because Sternberg, I think, previously had found hadrosaur mummy material. One of the crates included a skull that Sternberg thought would be very valuable. He mentions a crest, so it was presumably a Carithosaurus or Lambiosaurus. There was also a probable Parasaurolophus that is, he said, nicer than the holotype. And the holotype is in really great shape, so that's saying something. There's also a possible set of Parasaurolophus legs and hips, which would be great since Parasaurolophus is really rare. I don't even know if we have that material for, you know, the holotype or anything. Mm -hmm. And then there's an articulated hadrosaur tail. So we think those four hadrosaurs were in the crates. Hmm. There were also some other miscellaneous non-dinosaur things like a bunch of turtles, for example. <laughs> there see. actually were a bunch of turtles. I didn't just make that up. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Mount Temple has not been found after being scuttled, but the scuttle location was carefully documented to within one mile. So it should be easy enough to find. They said, quote, German accounts relate all portholes, hatch covers, and doorways were opened prior to her sinking. So when she rolled over, the loose cargo and crated fossils would probably have dropped out and sunk straight to the bottom with Mount Temple soon following. The ship itself is probably sitting upright on the ocean floor because virtually all metal ships sinking in deeper waters have a curious trait of righting themselves before reaching the bottom, end quote. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So I guess bad news is, potentially bad news, is that those crates probably fell out and therefore aren't protected by the ship. But I don't know how much protection the ship really would have given it. It might be nicer if they sort of drifted off on their own and maybe the wood would help slow the descent. <laughs> and then as long as the ship didn't land directly on top of them, they wouldn't have gotten crushed and destroyed. Hmm. The wood crates may have been eaten because wood is pretty attractive to some underwater organisms, but the fossils are likely still sitting there. They were mostly surface collected and surface collected fossil bones from Dinosaur Provincial Park tend to be pretty tough, which might th help them survive in that ocean environment. Mm -hmm. It's unknown how well the plaster jackets or clay matrix would have held up because they were in this clay that expands when wet and it's possible that that would have split open the plaster jackets, for example. Apparently plaster, once it hardens, isn't particularly water soluble, but it depends on the plaster. Sometimes it can get soft over time and this would be down there for a hundred years at this point. So maybe it got softened up and fell away. Or if there's little cracks in the plaster, the water could have gotten in, then gotten into the clay and the clay expands and then split open the plaster. It's only one way to find out. Gotta go find it. <laughs> it's possible that being under a bunch of salt water and at high pressure could have helped preserve the fossils too, or it might have also increased the decay. The best comparison to where Mount Temple is, is the Titanic, actually. Hmm. So Titanic is 13,000 feet or 4,000 meters below the surface. 
and many delicate items remained intact after nearly a century. All sorts of stuff, you know, like clothing and leather shoes and things like that were still intact when they went down there and found it. Sedimentation rate is really slow at this part of the ocean at about one inch per thousand years. So the crates of dinosaur bones will likely be there for quite a while if they haven't been destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's probably maybe even centuries that we could go down and still find these potentially intact. Mount Temple is slightly deeper than Titanic at about 14,400 feet. It's about 10% deeper than Titanic, but the, the pressure there is so high. It's crazy. But Deeper ships and submarines have been found. Titanic was one of the first really deep ones that was found. But since we found Titanic, lots of improvements have been made in finding deep ships. And we found quite a few since then, actually. It also helps that Mount Temple is made of steel. So what you can do is you can tow a magnetometer at depth, and then that can help you find it because it's such a huge thing. It's a, a pretty big ship. Obviously, it had, what did I say, 700 people on it and all this cargo. It mm -hmm. was a, a very large boat. So it should be possible to find it. And actually, in the paper, they talked about how it might be really inspiring as like a documentary. Like, ooh, imagine how many people would be excited to watch a show about finding lost dinosaur fossils on the bottom of the ocean. It has that connection to World War I. Mm -hmm. I'd it, watch it. Yeah. Apparently, the ship that sunk... The Mount Temple also is in the Atlantic, too. So you could do like a two-part thing of like finding that <laughs> ship, too. I think it would be amazing. I really hope someone finds it. And I really want to know what is in these jackets. It would be really fascinating to find out how well those dinosaur bones preserved in the ocean water, whether or not they even lasted. I, yeah, I want to know. Me, too. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you're not yet a patron, then please join our community and get all that bonus content we'll be covering for SVP. You can join at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Goodbye.